Hey guys, welcome back to the Max Spence Business Podcast. Today, Dave, a very special guest, but before I go into that, um, if you guys like the content I'm putting out, please like, subscribe, leave a review. It helps out a ton with the podcast. Um, today's guest is Donnie Bovine. So he's a four-time best-selling author and the CEO of Success Champion Networking. Uh, he's a podcast host of Success Champions and also the owner slash editor of Success Champions Magazine. He also runs um, the Badass Business Summit, Summit and also um, a champion's uh, round table. Awesome. Absolutely. Awesome. So uh, yeah, it's great, have, it's great to have you on the show, Donnie. Um, yeah, well, why don't we jump in with, uh, for people that maybe don't, haven't heard of you before at all, uh, why don't you give a little bit of intro about, you know, how would you sort of start into the entrepreneurial journey? Absolutely, Max. I'm totally stoked to be here, brother. Uh, uh, well done on your background and research. I appreciate the time you took to dive into my world a little bit. So yeah, for those who don't know me, former United States Marine, spent 20 years working for other people and I was straight commission sales the entire ride. Got tired of making everybody else wealthy. Uh, I jumped out, launched Success Champions in 2017. Um, launched podcasting in May of 2018. And, you know, now we host one of the top podcasts in the world. We're launching a second podcast called Growth Mode that's coming out in March. And, you know, books, speaking, tours, uh, we run five businesses. So had a lot of fun, broken a lot of shit along the way. And, you know, we've, 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 we've learned by failing forward and failing very fast. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you're a, uh, you're a very busy guy, man. Uh, so I, <laughs> I, 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 I sort of want to jump to uh, in the Marines and stuff like, um, and, and I've spoken to different military uh, personnel and stuff, and I've had them on the show. Uh, I want to get sort of your take from like going into the Marines, into the sales and into entrepreneurship. Do you think uh, the Marines really set you up for success or did it actually go against you? Or, you know, did you come out, um, you know, maybe not as good, not, not as better off. Um, like what, 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 what are your sort of thoughts on that? You know, I, I think the Marine Corps was a moment in time in my life. I, I mean, I can probably go back and look and say, okay, it did this and did this and then this, but you know, in, in corporate America, being a veteran doesn't mean shit. Nobody gives a fuck, you know? So it really comes down to that for my corporate career, being Marine didn't do anything. Um, you know, it, it, it's like having a four-year college degree. Nobody really cares. You know, um, people are, are, are proud that you served in the military. That's always cool. And it's appreciated. You know, um, I love it when people say thanks, you know. Um, but I, I think the Marine Corps helped me grow up quite a bit. Um, I, I think it got me a chip off my shoulder and it got me uh, pointed in some sort of direction in life. Um, uh, as far as helping me be an entrepreneur, I you know, I could, I could attribute that to being in the military. You got to be quick on your feet because there's no, you can't say no. Um, when, when somebody gives you an order and says, Hey, go this direction, you just figure it out. You don't question, you don't ask, you don't need all the details of how to do it. You just pull the trigger and run. And so I, I, I could correlate that to being an entrepreneur. Because I think the biggest detriment to most entrepreneurs is they start thinking. Um, and when you start thinking, you overthink, and then you're just going to screw everything up. Um, so I, I could definitely see that parallel to that time in life. I mean, I loved being in the Marine Corps. I also hated being in the Marine Corps. You know, I've never been a guy that liked anybody telling me what to do, how to do it, when to do it. So I don't know why the Sam Hill I signed up in the first place, but, you know, uh, <laughs> You know, it, it, it was a, it was a fun ride. It was a fun moment in time. You know? All right. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, something you pointed out there was uh, sort of the, just like, you know, just, uh, I, well, there's another guy that said it on the show. It's uh, I think it's the fire, uh, fire aim shoot or well, yeah. I think I might butcher, butchered that, but you know, j just uh, pretty much the, the mindset of just pretty much just rocking and rolling and just going forward, you know, yeah. not, um, not overthinking things, which I, I, I sort of, I'm trying to get around in my own life is, you know, overthinking things on a, you know, on different levels and stuff. So actually just doing more, uh, you know, just action instead of just like, you know, planning and research and other stuff. 
is uh, something I find very beneficial and, and probably something that, you, like you were saying, is super beneficial in your life. Um, I, I, I sort of want to jump now to um, pretty much getting into sales. What, what, why, why do you think you sort of chose to go into the, the sales arena? Oh, I did not choose to go into the sales arena. <laughs> so, so I never wanted to be a sales guy. Um, and I didn't really know what it was. So when I got out of the Marine Corps, I went to work for my best friend and his old man. And they had an HVA heating and air conditioning company. And so I started off actually uh, being the grunt that climbed under houses and up in attics. And it was dirty. It was nasty. Um, and, you know, it was Texas. So it was hot as hell. I, I, I did not enjoy that line of work. And I was actually getting ready to quit and try and go find something else to do for a living. But as I was getting ready to quit, Jerry, the owner, looked at me and goes, Hey, you're about to quit, aren't you? I'm like, yeah, I'm done with this shit. And he goes, well, before you go, let's try something. I said, all right, what's that? He goes, you're going to do sales. And I, and I actually looked at him and said, you know, what is sales? He goes, I'm going to hand you a bunch of pamphlets. You're going to go knock on doors and see if people will let us come look at their air conditioning. That was my entire training, man. That, that, that's what I was told to do. And I'm like, wait, I don't have to climb under houses. I don't have to, you know, get up in attics. I don't do anything. I just got to go knock on doors and talk to people. He goes, yep. He goes, and you're not getting paid unless we get paid. I'm like, I'll give it a hell. I'll try it. Um, so that's how I got into sales. Um, and if anybody's interested, I grew that company from a $300,000 to a $3 million company. And we took them from a residential to a commercial, uh, heating and air conditioning company. But that was, that was how I cut my teeth in sales. Um, but I, I, I don't think that I really got into big league, heavy hitting professional sales until I got into commercial printing. Um, and then that's, that's when I had to learn how to do professional business to business, working with major corporations and, you know, selling into them. So it, it was, for me, sales was a series of just doing what was in front of me, not necessarily choosing a path. Um, because at three years old or in third grade when Miss Smiley, my, my, my third grade teacher, if she would have looked at me in third grade and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? It damn sure not have been sales guy. So, you know, we just kind of fell into it and, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah, it was, it was, it was just something that was put in front of you. You, you just started executing it to the best of your ability. Um, okay, okay, awesome, awesome. So, what, what, with those first few years of being in sales, uh, what did you really get? Like, what did you learn the most out of those? Pretty much doing the door to door sales. Um, and um, mm -hmm. what were some key things that that you that you took away with you when you went into sort of the more like corporate world world of sales? Yeah. So the the funnest thing that. I've learned in all of my ride in sales was, you know, sales is just a conversation. You know, it's two people sitting down. Uh, one is, is talking about what they have. The other is asking questions and potentially seeing if they're interested. And at the end of the day, you know, it's not about closing a deal out. It's not about getting a commission or anything like that. Sales is about forming a relationship with somebody and, you know, making them a lifelong client and friend, um, client first, then friend. But, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated with, cause I didn't, my early sales career didn't grow up that way. Going door to door, it was tough. It was a very, very hard sale to knock on somebody's door and interrupt their day watch their exasperation on their face because now some guy is standing in their doorway um, and they don't want to talk to them. So I learned that the more I was just myself, that people will take you more seriously. Now, I forgot that lesson once I got into corporate sales um, because I started getting sales training and I started learning how to be a sales guy. And you know, once I really hit corporate America, success was suits, big cars, skyscraper buildings, you know, and you had to look and act apart. And I forgot the, the along that way in there that, you know, you just need to be yourself. And it was interesting because, you know, there was work Donnie and then there was home Donnie. And those were two different fucking people. And I was always worried that, that if, if people ever met the guy that was a home Donnie, which was a country guy that drank too much rum, partied, and 
love to hang out on the weekends and travel that they wouldn't like that guy. So for years in corporate America, I mean, I sold a lot of things, but I, but I struggled to really connect and keep clients for a long period of time until, you know, one day I had this light bulb moment that I'm really tired of being two different people. And it was amazing that when I went back to my roots from the door to door sales of just being me, I mean, I, in door to door sales, I'd walk up, it'd be a hundred degrees out. And I'd say, you know, you don't want to be here. I don't want to be standing out in this hundred degree weather. You know, can I just get a glass of water before I go on to the next house? And be amazed that that simple move of being real and authentic, that people were like, yeah, let me get you a bottle of water. Hold on. And they would bring it to you. And then you would start up a conversation. And the first time I did that, I'm like, well, damn, that worked. And then I started doing it at every house I went to, you know, um, and just and just repeating that process. And I had to pee a lot um, <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, drinking so much damn water. But but that's that same principle carries through that when you're just genuinely you you never remember have to have to remember what you said you never have to to worry about selling them something they don't need you go in you have a real damn conversation both people walk away from that conversation feeling like it was just an awesome moment in time and good shit happens uh and you can actually legitimately grow a business yeah yeah no and and, and th those are some great points and what, what i really love about that is uh, what you were what you were saying is just just being yourself, right? Which I, I know from like I'm 20 years old, and the majority of like sort of my, my people, my age, my friends and stuff. Um, when you start to get into like the business world, and you start you know networking with business people in like their 30s, their 40s, their 50s, their 60s, um, it feels like you have to like you have to front a lot, right? Because like you're young, you haven't like you haven't really done that much, but you know you have to front a lot. Um, and that was something that, that I, I learned through just like mistakes and errors and stuff is just being yourself. Like you were saying is absolutely the best course of action. Right. Um, yeah. and, and, and not, and, and, and when you're networking and stuff is like, um, that that's one thing I, I do want to talk to you that just popped into my head was, was network, like actually going to networking events and getting the most mm -hmm. out of it. Uh, cause I know from my point of view is like, I'll go to networking events, um, and it's sort of like the, the conversations are like uh, every, everybody's there for their own point, right? Which which I understand, yeah. right? Everybody's there yeah. to get their own point across. Um, but it's it's trying to like, uh, which I struggled with was trying to figure out like, how do I sort of engage these, get, engage people in these conversations and actually, you know, have them remember me in this, you know, for, you know, the specific service this, or the specific product or whatever, right? Because they're, they're like, everybody sort of has like their, their, um, their viewfinders on or whatever, right? And, and uh, pretty much they're just trying to find the person that they're trying to sell something to, or, you know, get something from, right? So yeah. um, fr from your experience, how, how, how do you, how do you approach like uh, in-person networking? Well, you know, the fact that everybody knows that everybody's there to meet somebody, hopefully get introduced to somebody the, to make a sale makes in-person networking one of the easiest things in the world. So the, the biggest strategy that I would always tell people is one, um, if you're old enough, you're only 20, so, so you can't fully follow this rule. But if you're old enough, first move you need to make at a, a networking event is hit the bar. Um, grab a drink, get some liquid courage, and then get out of the crowds. Um, so for you, first move is go to the bar, get a soda, um, and then get out of the crowds. No business happens in a crowd of people. What I want you to do is go find the wall huggers. I want you to go find the people that know they should, they're there to network and meet people. They know they're there to have business conversations, but can't pull themselves off the wall because they're so nervous. They're so worried about what people are going to think. And I want you to go make a friend and walk up to them, have your drink in hand, put your hand out, shake a hand and go, Hey, what brought you to this event? Not what do you do? Not, you know, what do you do for a living? Start off a casual conversation like you would if you're walking up to try and date somebody. And if you're at a bar and you see a hot person that you want to go out with, you don't walk up and go, hey, what do you do for a living? You walk up and go, hi, what are you doing here? Who are you here with? Why this party? What are you drinking? Right. And you get curious about them. So you go find the wallflower. You make a friend. You hang out with them. You figure about their world. 
and you don't even worry about telling them what you do. Your job is to dive so deep into their world that you could introduce them to your best clients. And the reason you do that is you're helping them out so tremendously be able to tell what they do for a living that they'll remember you, right? Most people at some point are going to ask you, what do you do for a living? And tell them, keep it simple. And then once you get to the point where you know everything about them, you know how to open the door, if it makes sense, pull out your phone, schedule an time to go grab a coffee later, right? Another day. But then take them over and go, I bet you look, you're here to meet a whole bunch more people. And they're going to be like, absolutely. Let's do that. Take them into a crowd of people, introduce them around. And when they feel a little comfortable, get out of that group and go find another wallflower. Oh, okay, okay. Right? And then every meeting, you have one goal. Every time you go to those events, you have one goal. Set two appointments. And they can be get to know you appointments or they can be sales calls. I don't care. But do not leave that event without setting two appointments. And if you have that as your mission you put, and you go after the wallflowers, you're going to be amazed at how much your business grows because those wallflowers, they need help. And people are like, well, what if I'm the wallflower? Stop it. Don't be the wallflower. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. The, 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 those are some great points because I've, I've, I've gone to I've gone to networking events and there's there's always people on the sidelines. There's always people mm -hmm. that are, you know, around or small, small, like maybe it's a one or two group. Because like when I first started going to networking events, I was like, I was really nervous. Right. I was like, yeah. I, I, you know, I was out of my depth. You know, like you, you're around people that are a lot older than you. That Some of them are very successful business people um you know running different companies and stuff um and trying to network and it's like uh you know you're having these conversations and you're trying to see like what value can i bring to you and, and approaching it from you know the other angle of you know just trying to learn more about the person and sort of understand them at a deeper level is, is i think is a great way of approaching networking events now now speaking of like COVID and stuff and i know that's very difficult now um how how do you how have you approached networking um or what advice do you give for networking right now because uh you know it's it's hard to go to networking events so we've run an in online business now for three and a half years the only thing that i did in per person in three and a half years was speaking engagements otherwise i didn't do in-person networking because i didn't need to um so um, but I, but I'm empathetic that a lot of people had no idea how to do online networking when, when, when this all happened. Uh, it's one of the reasons we launched Success Champions Networking was to help people be able to still uh, network and grow a business while they are stuck at home. So, uh, you know, a couple of things that people should absolutely be doing is one, you should be hitting every online event that you can find. I don't care what the hell they're teaching. Um, you know, it can be absolutely crap because you attend those events. And if, it, if it's good information, learn, right? Totally cool. Nothing wrong with that. Go learn. But you're there to see the other people that are attending the event as well. And your ass better be sending private chats and messages and, and, and you know, checking people's LinkedIn profiles out and seeing what they do and connecting with them on LinkedIn. And you're, and it's so cool when you attend an event, like Max, if you and I were, were attending an event, I'm gonna see you in that crowd and in the Zoom screen, I'm gonna go find you on freaking LinkedIn, type your name and find you. And I'm gonna send you a connection with a note on there. It has, hey, saw we both attended XYZ event. You know, here's a couple of things that I took away from this event. What'd you learn? Yeah, right? yeah, no. Yeah, that, that's good. You know, and then, you know, you do a couple of those events a week and there's so many events going on right now. It's insane. Um, and then, you know, you need to be part of some sort of networking um, and, you know, have a group that meets on a regular basis. Um, something bigger than a BNI or a chamber or roadie or anything like that. You need to get into a higher level of networking like Success Champions Networking. But, um, you know, you need to have something that puts you in a regular environment of people who are proactively out there growing their business as well. So you can get introduced to people. So yeah. events and, and, and a consistent meeting. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and, and th that's awesome. And, and uh, you know, the, and that's a much warmer way of opening a conversation, right. Instead yeah. of just being, you know, like if, 
because the person's been to that event, they'll be like, oh, you know, like we, we sort of are interested in the same thing. So it's like a little bit more friendlier, right? Um, I, I, I now want to go to uh, podcasting. And I know we were talking a little bit before we started recording. Um, pretty much, you know, how, how about you, how you grew your podcast, which I, I thought was really interesting about, you know, like what, what you were doing, um, you know, meeting people at bars in different places just to like grow your podcast uh, on the one to le one level. Um, can you talk about that a bit? And then yeah. also um, pretty much, you know, once you started getting growing a little bit what how did you continue to grow and uh sort of scale up yeah absolutely so uh, yeah max and i were talking a little bit before and he asked me he's like how are you growing your audience and you know i told him you know now we're doing the traditional ways of getting on stages and you know books and and networking alike but when i first launched success champions back in 2018 um one i had no idea what the hell i was doing as a podcaster you know it was it was uh, uh a learning experience for sure so I was doing a lot of uh, public speaking at that point. And, you know, I just realized that, you know, the people that were listening to podcasts were your road warriors, you know, the ones that were going to conferences, conventions and events, trade shows and the like. So every time I spoke somewhere, I would always try and find a hotel that looked like a bunch of business people would stay at. Um, and every night, you know, when I traveled, I'd find the bar. Um, I'd go find a couple of business guys that, or gals that were, you know, sitting in a bar. I, I tended to stay away from women. I'm happily married and didn't ever want to jeopardize that. So, um, but, you know, I'd find, you know, somebody that looked like they were in business attire, obviously looked like they were traveling. And I'd sit down, strike up a conversation. And I'd always ask them, you know, do you listen to podcasts? And they'd always like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, which podcast? And they're always like Joe Rogan. You know, everybody was listening to Joe Rogan. And uh, I'm like, hey, can I see your phone really quick? And they'd always look at me kind of funny. I'm like, well, open up your podcast app. And they would do it. And I would go and I'd plug my show, Success Champions, and right on their phone. And I would subscribe into my show. And when, the when I first launched my show, my picture was on the cover uh, of the, you know, thing. And so now they're on Apple, you know, pod or back then it was iTunes, but, or they're on Google podcast or whatever. And they're pulling up their phone and there's my picture right on their screen. They're like, wait, that's your show. I'm like, yeah. And, you know, it was cool at the time. A lot of it was already in a top 200 show. Um, so now I'm ranking and showing it on the top of podcast and, um, they would subscribe. And so I just did that and I became a walking billboard for the podcast as a whole. And, you know, uh, anything you do, you've got to be your greatest champion. You've got to be the one that's taking it to the world, telling the world what you're doing and, and you've got to enjoy what you do. Um, taking it back to sales. Then I'll talk about continuing growing podcast is, man, if you hate what you do, you're going to suck at selling it. Um, you've got to be completely passionate about it. And it's got to be the thing that totally gets your rocks off. Um, because if you don't like it, it comes through in the sales call. Um, we're launching a new podcast right now in growth mode. Um, that's coming out in March. And, you know, uh, that podcast, we've got a 14 person team attached to it. Um, that's putting it all together. So we've got video crew, SEO crew, a YouTube crew, a, uh, you know, the audio crew, we've got a social media crew. I mean, it's, it's pretty wild. The number of people are putting behind this, but um, we're doing that because I mean, there's so many social platforms in the marketplace right now and you've got to be good on at least a couple of them. We're trying to be good on all of them, but you got to be good on at least a couple of them. And in this day and age, the fastest way to, to grow a show other than belly to belly is to start networking with other podcasters. Get on shows, have conversations, and use your podcast as a networking tool. Um, it's amazing when you reach out to somebody instead of saying, hey, let's connect and talk about business, you're reaching out and say, hey, let's connect and talk about podcasting, you know, and, and it'll open a lot of doors. Um, and then, then the other side of that, man, is, is you got to tell your story. You, you got to get out there and tell people why you got the show. What are you doing with it? Who should be listening to it? Um, and then you got to tell your ride along the way. You know, this is why I started a podcast. This is why I screwed up the podcast. This is the things that are working. These things that aren't working and, and watch how it continues to uh, evolve and grow. 
And then the last thing is you got to put out good content. If your content sucks, then nobody's going to tune in to listen to it. So, you know, those are the biggest things right now. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. The, 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 those are amazing, some amazing points. Uh, with actually uh, j- just talking from more of like a little, a little bit of an editing standpoint. I don't know if you have your own po- podcast or you have somebody else that's outsourced to edit it. Um, do you sort of like w- with these podcasts? Do you sort of move bits around with it? I- I've talked to some other podcasters, and they sort of depending on what will happen, they'll they'll move bits around in it. I- I'm sort of like right now is more of like uh, pretty much just shoot and then rip it and then edit it. Not really not taking too much change to it. Just really just like a conversation, just putting it out there, not playing with it too much. Uh, and, and what are your thoughts on that? So it's it's a it's a tough, interesting question. It's it's tough because right now there's 1.6 or 1.8 million podcasts in a marketplace. Most of them are recruited recorded zoom conversations. People don't want to listen to just a recorded zoom conversations. They're having enough of them on their own, right? They, they, they don't want to listen to two people just shoot to shit because they're spending all day on zoom and meetings and everything else. Um, they don't want to hear it again. So for a show to truly be successful in this day and age, it's got to be a produced show, meaning what's the point? What's the concept? What, what is the reason people should be tuning in? How are you edutaining? How are you capturing them? And, you know, there's a lot of coaches and consultants and whatnot that have launched shows. Then, you know, they're getting 20 to 30 downloads because their show sucks. And, you know, it, it's, I love asking podcasters, how often do they listen to their own show? And most podcasters will tell you they don't. And the reason they don't is because their show sucks so bad, they won't even listen to it. So, so I would tell you to produce it, put segments in, put key thoughts in, um, and make it so it's fun for people to listen to. And they want to dive in and they want to uh, really listen to the show as, as a whole and, and, you know, you come from the perspective of what is a listener looking for? What would they want to ask a guy like me, right? What would they, you know, want to ask your other guest? And you've got to be their advocate and ask the questions that they're thinking about as they're in their cars listening, or they're doing laundry and listening, or they're working out and listening. You know, you've got to be their champion um, as a host. And, you know, when, you think about, you know, man, this was a cool moment. This is a cool segment. You know, you can do simple things like you can come in and go, Hey, you know, I was really curious about Donnie growing a a podcast. And in this quick moment of time, he's going to take us through a couple of key things that he's done to, to grow a show. And some of the things that I really like what he said was, you know, do this, do this, do this, and then cut into me coming in and then talking about that. Um, it builds more character to the show as a whole. And I know that adds a whole lot of editing and work on your end to pull all that off. Um, But you didn't get into podcasting just to have a show nobody listens to, right? (laughs) So you get into podcasting to, to gain a following, get people into your message and story. So you need to, to produce for them. And uh, what you're going to find is the more time you put in putting a show together, the more value, the more people are going to share it and want to listen and come back and dial into your show. So um, that's the tip of the iceberg of it, but but th- that'll give you enough to play with to have some fun with it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh hundred percent. Like, yeah, the, 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 those are some great points. Um, and you know, like w- w- with my podcast right now is like, that's, that's what I'm trying to like, sort of trying to figure out, trying to take it to the next level um, and, and trying to add some other stuff to it and trying to figure out, um, you know, how, 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 how can I make it better? How, how can people, you know, want to, you know, want to listen to this and, you know, share it. And it's like, uh, cause it's like that, that, that's, that's the whole purpose of, you know, having the podcast, right. It's like, you want somebody to listen to this and be like, wow, this was so damn good that I want to, you know, I got to tell my friends about mm-hmm. this, or I have to recommend my friends, family, or other people I meet about like, Hey, yep. you know, it's, it's sort of like the Joe Rogan podcast, right. Where it's like somebody sees an episode and they recommend it to like five or six other people just because the episode's so good. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, uh, that, that's spot on. 
Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I want to now go to sort of the, the mindset side of, you know, business, um, you know, throughout you, you have a lot of experience in life and then business, you know, sales and running your own company. Um, I want to sort of talk about sort of like the hardships that you faced and how you sort of overcame them. Um, and, and would you mind sharing maybe a story from your life that, you know, it was something that, you know, in business or let's say personal or something related that was really hard that you sort of overcame and what did you sort of take away from that and how did it sort of, you know, help you grow as a person? Yeah. So it's really, really, so, you know, I spent 20 years working for other people, you know, uh, in the sales game. When I launched my business, um, I didn't know or understand what it meant to be a business owner. Um, I was a sales guy. As a sales guy, I sold shit. Somebody else came in, took care of it, right? They they um, build the account. They, they put the account together, operations, everything. My job was to sell. And so... When I launched the business, uh, what I didn't understand was not only did I have to sell, but now I have to bill it. Oh, crap. Now I got to do the delivery of it. Um, oh, crap. Now I've got to make sure they're getting what they want. And then I would find myself not out selling because I was trying to do run the business. So six months into running Success Champions, um, I stood in the back porch of my farm looked my wife dead in the eye and said, babe, we're about to lose everything we own. Um, because I had no clue how to be a fucking business owner. And my wife, God love her, looked right back at me and said, you better get off your ass and go sell something. And it was a, it was a, a moment of a light bulb to where I realized that I was trying to spend too much time on the backside of the business um, versus actually trying to grow a business. And, and, you know, I tell everybody podcasting saved my business because it taught me all the things I didn't know how to do. Um, but the mindset behind it, uh, that still remains one of the toughest conversations I've ever had in my life. I mean, as a, as a, as a guy, as, as the breadwinner of our household, um, you know, my wife put a lot of faith in me that when I jumped out and walked away from corporate America, that I was going to make this shit work. And here I was having to look at her and telling her it wasn't working. Um, and dude, I, I felt like the biggest piece of shit on the face of the earth because I wasn't holding up my, my end of this bargain here. She was supporting me. She was honoring me. She was helping me out. And here I was fucking everything up. And that moment of telling her that, you know, we're going to lose everything uh, weighed super heavy on me. And, you know, had I stayed mentally in that place, I'd be working for somebody else right now. Um, but it was the catalyst to get me to flip the script. And it was amazing that at that moment in time, I had some huge clarity on me as a sales guy working for somebody else. You got a lot of excuses to use. If your sales are down, you can blame the economy. You can blame COVID. You can blame bad weather because I'm in Fort Worth, Texas. We just went through bad weather, right? Um, you can blame, you know, competition. You got a lot of excuses for not performing in sales. When you're running a business, you got no fucking excuses because there's nobody to blame but you. I learned down there in that pit that success, that's my fault. Failure? That's my fault too. And when I realized that life was on me, life got really fucking simple. Not easy, but simple. And so the biggest mindset shifts I made were one, I'm running a business. I got to become a CEO. I wasn't being a CEO. Two, there's no reason to give a shit what other people think about you because they're not. The only reason people give a shit what other people think about them is because they're, we're all judgmental assholes. We're all thinking bad shit about other people. So we're thinking they're thinking bad shit about us. Turn off the noise. They're not thinking about you. They're too worried about what you think about them. Right. And you know, that was the evolution for me is as I became a business owner, as I continued to move and go forward, 
I kept finding my footing. I kept evolving and, and progressing forward. And I, you know, I learned that when something popped up that scared the shit out of me or looked like it was going to be really hard to do, that that was the exact thing I had to go do. Because that's the moment that the universe was saying, here you go, Donnie, either get in or get the fuck out. Step in or shut up. And the moments that I stepped in were tough, hard lessons learned. But those are the moments I can look back on and go, shit, that was the exact thing I needed to go through. That's what I needed to learn to be able to go to the next level. And I think the more people embrace that, just be you. Show up, keep moving forward, turn off the noise in your head, and you're going to be amazed at how much further you can go in life. And nobody gives a shit about your failure or success. So you might as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, 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 wow. The, the, that's crazy. And, 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 and something I, I, want, I want to talk about there is um, um, what, what do you think it was that sort of, you know, sort of propelled you forward instead of saying like, oh, you know, like it's not working. I'll just go back to, you know, sales. <laughs> um and you know that the, the business is not working what 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 sort of made you say no you know what i'm just gonna dig down and just you know keep going forward um the, truthfully the fear of the world seeing me fail so in in my hometown of fort worth texas man and before i launched this company i had a pretty good local brand i mean a lot of people in fort worth knew who i was i was 40 under 40 and i'd won a bunch of awards and done a bunch of cool things and you know, I ran several networking groups and sat on boards and, you know, so I, I had a really good brand in town and the, the idea or thought that those people that I networked with, that I ran with, that, that would be, had become friends, some are still friends, um, would see me fail. And the idea of the whispers of, oh my God, Donnie failed, you know, were some of the strongest catalyst to keep me moving forward. And there were some people along my journey that told me, you know, this wasn't going to work, that I wasn't going to do it. And I used that to fucking drive me. And, and it became my thing that merely knowing someone thinks you can't do it, man, that's motivation from hell. So, so I, I, there's been times in my life, I put a post-it note up on my freaking wall of that person's name, what they said. And I'm like, hold my beer and watch this shit. Cause I'm about to go crazy. Don't tell me I can't do it. We'll make this shit happen. And, um, that that's been fun. So it was, it was really the, the fear of people thinking that I failed and couldn't do it or the idea of people telling me that I wasn't going to be able to pull this off. And, and those became fuel. And, and for your listeners, man, the, those moments of time when you're in those dark places and you don't know the new way to, to step forward, just pick one path and start stepping and ask yourself, what am I learning? What here in this moment am I meant to learn? Then start applying those lessons. So like for me, it was, you know, here I am not running a business. What do I need to learn? Well, I need to learn to become a CEO. What does that mean? And one of the funniest first tasks I ever did was I wrote down every task I was doing in my business, everyone, um, down to the stupid things like taking out trash. And I wrote those all in a single clown on a sheet of paper. I then drew a line, you know, next to each one of those. And then above it to the right, I wrote this question. Would Steve Jobs do this task? Because in my head, Steve Jobs was a CEO. I'm like, all right, would Steve Jobs do any of these tasks? And I went through every task and put yes or no, whether Steve would do this job. And it was amazing. I was doing so much stupid shit in my business that I shouldn't have been doing. But yet I couldn't afford to outsource it. Right? I couldn't afford to pay somebody else to do it. So I had to get really, really creative. I'm like, okay, how do I get this off my plate and get it to somebody else? And then I would go find people who were just starting their businesses, starting their journey. Um, like my first podcast editor, 
he was a video production guy and he was just building up his video production company and he needed sales help. He's like, I don't know how to sell. Can you teach me sales? I'm like, yeah, can you edit my podcast? And he's like, yeah, cool. Let's trade. And that's how I got my first outsource person. And, and, you know, I just kept learning and applying and, you know, I screwed up some of the outsourcing. I screwed up some of the, you know, processes along the way, but it was, it was doing something, fucking it all up going, what am I meant to learn? Applying that and then moving forward. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, that, 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 that that's crazy. And, and, and I love, I, lo- I love the points that you make, um, you know, in, in, in that question and w- w- with, w- with the answers and stuff were, were absolutely amazing. Um, uh, sort of leading on to that, uh, well, leading from that, um, what you've, you've networked with probably thousands of people. Um, you know, you've been in rooms with other business owners, you know, executives, all this sort of stuff. Um, what, why do you think some people that when they get into business and entrepreneurship, just absolutely crush it and others find a much harder time, uh, you know, being successful in the business world. Um, I mean, th- there's a lot of reasons. Yeah, I don't think I can really pinpoint it down to to one, but to give a couple. One, um, I think very few people are actually born a business owner and entrepreneur. I mean, you got guys like Gary V, of course. You know, that dude's been an entrepreneur since he was knee high to a grasshopper. Um, but me. You know, in comparison to a Gary Vee, I never had the baseball trading games. I never had the lemonade stand. I didn't have a dad who was an entrepreneur, you know, so I was never in the environment to do that. I mean, I didn't start a business till I was 40. So I think when the desire to finally live your life on your terms versus somebody else outweighs the whatever else you're doing, then I think that's what catapults most people to start a business. I think most people fail is because when they get right to the moment that they're fixing to learn some of the greatest lessons ever, i.e. me almost losing everything that I owned, they throw in the fucking towel. When if they would literally just push through that moment and keep going on and going through that moment, man. One of the things that I kept telling myself um, is this is the shit that I've read about in books. This is that, that moment of time. And I'm, I'm going through it and everything else. I'm telling myself, man, this is that moment of time. This is what I've read in every book, every conference, every motivational thing is that dude said, you know, if I, I, if I so glad that I held on that moment, And that's what I kept telling myself, man. This is that moment. This is that exact time that if I can hold on through this, it's going to work. And I think most people throw in the towel at that point. And then the excuses come out. Well, I I couldn't do it because I have kids or I'm married. I'm a wife. I have this. and, 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 And the excuses is what actually ultimately kill them uh, more so than anything. But, but it's the grit to get through that moment. Because everybody's going to go through shitty times. I don't give a shit. You run a business, you're going to go through some rough damn times figuring out how to make that thing bigger. Yeah, yeah, no, no, 100%. Uh, and, and, and that's something that I, I found really interesting was like, you know, it's, it's, it's those moments where, where you think everything's coming down, you know, it's all crashing down. But actually, those are your, those are your sort of like, those are your best moments, actually. Cause that's yeah. where it's like, that's where sort of like your, your mindset is going to be sort of fortified and, you know, that strength to continue going. And it's like, if you can get through, you know, almost losing everything or, you know, losing, having to sell something, you know, maybe having to sell your car, or, you know, or, you know, downsize or something like that. And then coming back from that, it's like anything else that happens, you're like, this is not that bad. Um, and you, you can just deal with it. Yep. And, and this isn't my phrase. I wish I could give credit to whoever said it, but man, your success story becomes somebody else's survival book, right? The shit you get to go through and talk about the things you survived, you know, that, that is literally going to be somebody else's guide plan on their journey to be able to get done what they need to get done. That's, that's the cool thing about podcasts and everything else is you get to share these kind of stories out, you know, in hopes that somebody hears the message and is like, fuck, that's exactly what I needed to hear 
to to uh, apply and find fuel in my life to move forward and, that, and that's the cool thing about it so you're never doing anything just for yourself um there's always somebody else involved and yeah. sometimes it's just surely to, to to share the story yeah yeah and, and that's saying that that's why i love podcasting is like and, and gary v does it does it like uh very well is like he he just hammers so much information at you at all the time it's like and he's just, you know, he, he, he's just in the game of like, somebody's going to hear this at the right time with they with the, you know, the right words and then the right context that they need to hear. And it's going to, it's just going to change their life. You know, it'll, it'll just be a complete mindset switch. And, um, and, that, and that's what I love about podcasting is you're able to do that from having, you know, amazing yeah. guests such as yourself on the show. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. So uh, I, I know we're coming to the end here. Um, I wanted to ask you sort of one more question, if, if you're good with that. Sure. Awesome. Yep. So, um, you know, you, like, like you were talking about, you, you face some very, very stressful, stressful situations. Uh, how have you sort of managed that stress? Um, yeah. Like, so like, and, and, and rum, and rum. <laughs> lots of rum. <laughs> no, no, um, no. Um, I have a full working farm. So, um, I run all five businesses from the farm. Um, uh, we got goats, chickens, ducks, geese, and, and the whole nine yards. And uh, work-life balance is an absolute fucking myth. And anybody who's trying to get to work-life balance most likely hates what they fucking do. Um, so, so for me, the escapism that I've used to embrace the stress and everything else is I put in some unique plays. Like eight o'clock every night, my business turns off. And I sit down and it's two hours with my wife. We get to hang out and, and do whatever. Doesn't mean that I'm not going to reply to messages and everything else, but I'm not going to be doing accounting or, or, you know, heavily into the business. Um, so that happens every Thursday at about two o'clock, I shut down the whole company. Everybody goes, does whatever the fuck they want. And we started it. We call it the farm day. And we started that because I ran a full working farm. There's a lot of shit to do on a farm. And I needed time to go mow the, the you know, the acreage. Um, I needed time to fix and repair fences and do all that. So um, for the last couple of years, we've had every Thursday being a farm day and everybody works till two o'clock central time, whatever that is for some people that's noon, some people that's four, but, um, and we shut down the company. You're going to do whatever the hell you want. Don't work on the company. Doesn't mean we're not, you know, we're talking via messenger and some other things like that, but, but it's that time to go decompress because one of my favorite meditation times, decompression times is sitting on the back of a tractor for hours. Mowing the grass is, is a great way to just get caught up on your own thoughts. Um, it's, it's finding those moments of time where you can, you can get away from it all and quit I just wish people would quit beating themselves up that they're they're on vacation with their family and thinking about the business. Of course, you're thinking about the fucking business. It's your livelihood. That's okay. You're allowed to think about the business all the time. The more people don't beat themselves up about thinking about the business when they're hanging with their family, the more they're actually going to be able to hang with their family. It's, it's an amazing, you know, paradox. So, so that's it for me is, is find those moments of time where, where you have your outlets. I don't care what the outlets can be, it can be punching bags, shooting guns. It can be, you know, drinking. I don't care. Um, just make sure you have your outlets. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I understand. And then the, the, those are some great points. So yeah, we're, we're coming to the end here. Thank you, Donnie, for uh, coming on the show. It was absolutely amazing, you know, he hearing your story um, and, you know, all, all the great advice that you gave. Uh, where can people find out more about you, uh, your current projects, books, all that sort of good stuff? Yeah, so the, <coughs> excuse me, the easiest place to to find me is just go to DonnieBovine.com um, and you can find all the information and, and stuff there. Um, find me on LinkedIn ton of information there uh and then success champions networking.com but donnybovine.com will get you all the books um and everything else that we have as part of the family um and everything else um and guys do me a favor if you're listening to this show and you got any value out of it whatsoever like one nugget you could take and apply your business do me a favor 
and go tell a friend how to subscribe to this show. Literally grab their phone, bring up Max's show, type it in, and click subscribe on their phone. The number one thing for, for podcasters to make their shows great and awesome is by supporting them with that little move. And literally by subscribing to Max's show, it gives him, a, it's like you walked up and gave him a virtual hug. So, so tell somebody else about how awesome his show is and get them subscribed here to mean everything to them. Awesome. Awesome. Well, th th thank you very much for that, Donnie. Uh, and yeah, it, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. My honor, brother. Appreciate you.